Good afternoon. My name is Steve Hughes. I'm a physician or a spine surgeon uh, in uh, North of Virginia. And we've got a great topic today. I think it's a topic that I spend a majority of my time uh, talking to patients about. It is what to do if you're offered surgery in, in a summary. And this is going to apply to a lot of uh, different procedures, um, primarily uh, anything that's going to involve any significant invasion of your body, you know, be it a colonoscopy, a you know, broken bone set, uh, anything. There are going to be certain aspects of this talk that you're going to want to refer to to make sure that you're having an educated uh, discussion with your uh, physician about making sure that you get uh, the proper questions answered and that you're the best advocate for yourself that you can be. So basically, surgeries or procedures boil down into three different types. They uh, can be emergent procedures, which means they really have to be done within a matter of hours to a day. They can be urgent procedures that need to be done over a matter of uh, a couple of days. And then lastly, the primary thing that I'm focused on, and that's elective procedure. You really want to get a sense from your physician, first of all, what kind of procedure am I having doing? Is it an emergent? Is it an urgent procedure? Or is it elective? Because the questions are a little bit different for each. Again, we're going to focus primarily on elective procedures today, but a lot of the principles we're going to discuss really can be applied to all of these things. And really when I'm offering patient surgery, there's three basic parts to the procedure that I wanna make sure that they're aware of. And, and the patients that are really advocates for themselves will ask this right off the bat. Number one, you wanna know what the actual procedure's name and, and some general outlines of the technique are gonna be. This does not mean you need to have every uh, pattern or habit of what happens during the surgery memorized, but just asking general questions. Like, for example, let's take a disc herniation, which is one of my more common procedures. I basically give the patient some internet advice because the other thing that happens is initially when you're first offered the procedure, you can be a little bit shaken and not really hear what happens during the office visit. So I make sure that they leave with a piece of paper with a good website to read up and, and look at the actual videos of the procedure or, and commonly asked questions about the procedure. And once that's, once that's done, once you've described, had the surgeon describe what the procedure is going to be to you, there's the next question is going to be, why exactly do I need this? And you really want to have him show you on the images, on the x-rays, on the lab results, anything that he's using to make this determination. Uh, show me and explain in layman's term what this is going to be. So, for example, with the disc herniation, what I'll do is taking the actual images I will describe generalities of the anatomy to the patient, point out normal, which you want your surgeon to do, and then point out abnormal. And once they point out the abnormal, you're going to want to say, okay, how is that affecting my body? What exactly are the symptoms it's causing? Them? Because one of the things that comes up often is abnormal results or abnormal findings on a test or a lab test or a MRI or a CT scan. And you really, they don't always mean that you have symptoms related to that. Uh, like for example, you can have small disc herniations and even real, rather big disc herniations, which don't really cause that much in the way of symptoms. So you want, to sh want your surgeon to show you on the images exactly what is the anatomic deviation that they're going to be working on. So we now know kind of what the procedure is in general terms. We know from the images what the anatomy of the problem is. And now we land on the most important part of the, of the whole discussion. And that is what's the goals of this surgery? It's very in surgery of any kind, um, injections, colonoscopies, spine surgery, even rudimentary spine surgeries, they all carry risks. 
So you want to make sure that the goal that you have with this, and if it's, you know, your pain you get once every month, that's kind of a no-brainer that you're not going to have a very invasive procedure unless the, the doctor really is explained why you need it. Um, whereas if you're in pain constantly and on narcotics or needing injections frequently because of the pain, um, it's going to be a pretty easy sell, so to speak. But the last, this last most critical part for you is, doctor, what, what can I expect after this procedure? And that's going to really vary by age in part. And you want to have this goal understood between the two of you. If it's to get back to playing golf, if it's to simply do a walk around the mall, if it's to get back to high intensity exercise. And I'm going to give a few examples of what I mean with each of these. Um, these are all variables that you have to understand prior to agreeing to any surgical procedure. So let's back up for just a minute about the goals because this is so important. Um, I have had a patient uh, who does, he's basically one of, a CrossFit trainer who had a deformity of his back, which we looked at and he went through extensive therapy, even though he's in excellent physical shape. And he, you know, wanted to have a procedure. We talked about the different procedures but where the mismatch came and where we wind up, wound up, I wound up not agreeing to the surgery was that I thought the goals were mismatched. In other words, he wanted to proceed at a level of, of physical activity that I thought was unrealistic given his age, which was in the you know, his early 50s, and the type of procedure that he needed. I said, I would continue doing this, your activities, this high intensity. Uh, training as long as your body allows you and when you're ready to settle for some more reasonable goals again good exercise potential but not that kind of crossfit exercise potential you know then we can talk about you know more active things such as the fusion surgery that that uh, you know, we he and i were talking about on the other hand uh 30 year old in with a disc herniation and severe leg pain not responsive to injections not responsive to physical therapy for two to three months. Um, those people after a surgical procedure can be expected to go back to very high intensity activity. So on one hand, the 50 something year old that says, I want to do this level of CrossFit, not a reasonable goal, as opposed to the 30 something year old with a disc herniation um, who wants to go back to doing Ironmans and triathlons, that certainly is a reasonable thing. So understanding the procedure, understanding the anatomy of what you're getting corrected, and then lastly, being very, very careful to both the surgeon and yourself, understanding where once you're recovered, what that goal is gonna be. Like, how do we measure success? For some very old patients I've had, it's been as simple as being able to get off of narcotics. It sounds like a pretty low bar, um, but that's important to the elderly because they can fall and have dizziness and a variety of other symptoms with this medication. That just getting off narcotics is not an unre it's a very good, not unreasonable goal. Um, yet again, my 20 to 30 year olds want high intensity activities, and that also is a reasonable goal, depending on what the type of procedure is. Some side notes to this, uh, like I said, you're going to be, most people are a little bit in shock when the doctor offers a procedure, a surgical procedure. Um, make sure that you take it seriously. Make sure that the physician is taking this seriously uh, and that they understand that uh, you're going to be an advocate for yourself. And that means you get a little notebook. You do get on the internet and read about this procedure, look at the videos, take notes. Again, you can go overboard with it and, and get too much in the weeds, and that's not helpful to you or the surgeon. But there's no reason that you should not have a little book with a variety of questions about our three main topics. And just to review them again, what exactly is the procedure they're talking about? Show me the images and how this is going to change for me. And then lastly, what sort of outcome or what, what are going to be our shared goals to go through this procedure, which in many cases causes some trauma. 
Um, there are definitely uh, procedures in the spine that are done that are more traumatic than others, uh, even the minimally invasive ones. Um, but they, these uh, procedures used with uh, in the right patient uh, can really just make a world a world of difference. I just uh, recently got a picture and a uh, letter which was very touching from a patient back in 2008 that I operated on uh, who was uh, hiked all of the uh, 40 some peaks in the you know in the Adirondacks. So you know you really can get better, you can meet goals. Um, and your life can be better with surgery. You just really have to understand those three principles that we talked about. And I'm sure we're going to get some questions on what those principles are again. And and sometimes you need to just hear them in a couple of different ways to really let them sink in. But uh, that's that was the main focus of what I wanted to talk about today. And I spend so much time going over this with patients that I think uh, all of you out there that are listening and uh, and getting this sense will really uh, save yourself and your surgeons a lot of time. But thank you for your attention and I look forward to your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Hughes. So something that we are getting from patients is asking, when they're asking about their goals and outcomes, should they also be asking safety questions about the procedure? Yes, absolutely. And a matter of fact, that is one of the parts that's also commonly misunderstood. You're going to be asked at some point, um, and I would make the ask relatively soon after you're offered surgery to take a look at the consent forms for, for the procedure. Uh, if you and I are going to go skiing, we sign waivers of liability. Consent forms and waivers of liability are very different animals. Um, in one case, uh, you know, I've had patients ask, say, is this a waiver of liability? It's absolutely not. These consent forms are an educational tool so that you can learn more medicine as a patient by saying, oh, what does this mean? A CSF leak, what does this mean? You know, an infection of the you know vertebral body. The consenting process, which should not happen five minutes typically before you're having surgery, but should happen when you're in the um, peace and quiet of the doctor's office or you know, well ahead of time, at least for elective procedures. Again, we're talking about elective procedures, not emergencies and not urgent procedures necessarily, but uh, in some quiet, when you have time to look at these things, read them over, understand in the consenting process what the words are that you're, you know, as the possible risks, and then uh, have your surgeon go over with it over them uh, with you in detail. Thank you. What things should have been tried before a patient is offered an elective surgery? Should they have had injections or physical therapy or anything like that? Great questions. And in most cases, um, the vast majority of cases, unless there's significant paralysis or weakness, and I'm talking strictly about the spine here, um, yes, you should absolutely try physical therapy. You should absolutely, uh, you know, make a uh, make a pass in injections or other non-surgical type procedures with less invasion of your body prior to considering a surgical procedure. Now, there are times when it hurts too much to do physical therapy. There are times when the injections simply are not capable of doing you know they're getting people to the pain-free state that they want but i do want you to realize that conservative therapies physical therapy injection therapy and medications always typically should be tried to some degree for some period of time prior to any consideration of surgery thank you we have a patient saying that they have a ortho virginia physician who is helping them with their lower back pain However, that physician is not a surgeon. If in the future they decide with their physician that surgery would be the next avenue to explore, how would they go about getting in contact with you or another surgeon? We have an excellent system uh, called Book It, which is part of the Epic system that we use as our electronic health record, which is just excellent. Um, and also we have uh, you know, some general numbers to call uh, but I think the first step with is uh, we have an excellent pain management service at, at Ortho Virginia, 
uh, growing, you know, pretty much every month. And the physicians that are doing the non-operative care uh, for this are really well versed in talking to patients about some of the simple initial aspects of surgery. So, in other words, when you say to your pain management specialist from North Virginia, hey, uh, is it possible this is going to need surgery? They're going to, in general, know how to at least get you started or to start the process of talking about it. And by the same token, I would say that our surgeons uh, here at Ortho Virginia are very knowledgeable about um, uh, pain management, conservative care techniques. Uh, my partners up here in the north, with partners down in the south, east and west, all through Virginia, uh, are capable not only of doing some of the pain management aspects of the self, but uh, also uh, coordinating care with the pain management specialists. And I would wager that uh, most of their practices are like mine, where we'll see, you know, 100 plus patients a week, but only offer surgery to three or four because we we are versed in how to take care of it. And just because you're being sent to a surgeon doesn't mean you're going to walk out, you know, walk out with a scar on your back. Thank you. A patient is saying that her spine surgeon is recommending neck surgery just due to some um, anatomical characteristics of her neck. However, this patient is older, has hip pain, and is looking to have hip surgery as well. In a situation like that where there is hip pain but no neck pain, is there a preference order that you use to figure out which type of surgery should be done first? Yes, excellent, excellent question. And we're gonna get in the weeds a touch with this because this is a little bit of a technical a technical aspect aspect of this that is you guys will find interesting. And again, I'm going to defer to your surgeon, of course, to, for you two to make your final decisions. But in general, the spinal cord can be compressed, both in the neck or in the mid back. If the spinal cord is compressed enough, it actually can change colors. It's, it's a condition called myelomalacia. M-Y-E-L-O Malaysia. And um, this myelomalacia is an indicator that if you're put to sleep for another problem, for example, shoulder surgery, knee surgery, hip surgery, appendix, gallbladder surgery, in the process of being put to sleep, your blood pressure can drop. And as that blood pressure drops, the spinal cord that is being squeezed is at serious risk for becoming further ischemic and almost having a quote unquote stroke of the spinal cord. So if your surgeon is seeing the kinds of changes that I think that you're describing, it's very wise to consider getting the neck taken care of first. Um, with all kinds of surgeries, I highly recommend that patients get second opinions. Matter of fact, I provide my patients when they're offered surgery automatically with a couple of people to to go talk to because just each of us has got our own unique way of communicating with patients and sometimes you can hear something better from a second opinion than you can with the first or the third opinion so always get second opinions uh, for these elective procedures and I um, and uh, I hope I was able to describe the problem that you're talking about uh, well enough and that is that some neck and, and mid-back problems where there's pressure on the spinal cord trump all the other conditions that you may have going on. Thank you. Can a patient improve the bone density in their spine, for example, so that after a spinal fusion, the vertebrae are strengthened so that they don't gradually crumble? Yes. One of the most exciting uh, things that's really come on the radar in orthopedics recently is that we are vastly vastly under treating our predominantly female population, but our elderly and female po elderly population too, in uh, under treating uh, osteoporosis. The rheumatologists have been um, torch bearers for this as they treat uh, osteoporosis. Our endocrinologist colleagues do a great job of assessing this and also treating it. But <laughs> orthopedics is uh, really, it's coming into our consciousness now. And between preoperative and postoperative infusion therapies for osteoporosis, 
together with uh, intraoperative supplementation of uh, uh, bone quality, sometimes with bone cement. Um, this is uh, a really a big deal that you're talking about, and it's something that absolutely can be improved. Thank you. What medication can help lower back lower back pain after physical therapy? Typically, I'm going to tell um, my standard patients that the therapy of, of is really the lotion. You know, motion is lotion with therapy as far as getting the parts moving, stretched out. And it's going to be unusual if they have a lot of pain afterwards. But of course, with our heightened awareness of the uh, troubles with narcotics, etc., I'm going to tell them extra strength Tylenol if they don't have any significant liver issues. And of course, the leave or over, over the counter a leave or Motrin um, if they don't have any significant kidney issues or bleeding issues. Thank you. Surgery for, and please forgive me, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this right, uh, spondylolisthesis. When yes. would that be indicated? That's a great, great uh, study in what we talked about earlier in. Uh, knowing the procedure, knowing how the procedure is going to be done, and knowing our goals with it. Spondylolisthesis is simply Greek for a slipping bone. So one bone slides on another bone. And that is uh, in up to 40 million people just in the United States alone. It does increase in uh, incidence as we get older because arthritis makes the bones, can make the bones slip. And so spondylolisthesis is probably one of the top two things that I see in clinic. And it boils down to, number one, is it just a picture and the patient's not having much pain? Or is the listhesis causing so much nerve compression that the person can't live a normal life? Or is it somewhere in between? Um, that's a really relatively quick evaluation. I can look, I can really sit down and look at a picture of a, a slip in the vertebral body, talk to the patient for a few minutes, examine them uh, really relatively quickly, and tell them where on the spectrum they should fall. Because most spondylolisthesis can just be observed. You know, five to 10% of them need surgery. 50 plus percent of them can be watched and the other you know, 35% or so can be, uh, 35 to 40% can be treated with simple medications, occasional injections, bracing, et cetera. But it sounds like a dangerous diagnosis, but it is super common and it's not dangerous. Thank you. If someone has been getting pain management injections, how can you tell when it's time to discontinue those and start thinking about surgery? I do think I would do defer to some degree to my um, pain management colleagues. As I said, we've just got a super program here uh, throughout Ortho Virginia and pain management. But I will tell you that when you get upwards of three injections or so, uh, three separate injections over a 10 month time frame, in general, there's going to, and you're still having significant discomfort and significant activity limitation. In general, you're going to be told uh, to start to talk about more active interventions such as surgery, you know, with a surgeon or with one of the pain management specialists. Thank you. Do the rods used in spinal fusion cause stiffening or mobility issues such as when you're bending or stretching? Do they affect posture? They shouldn't. If anything, the rods are going to improve your posture. And as long as your hip movement is good and flexible, um, you can have, you know, a few levels of your spine actually fused and you're not going to notice a tremendous amount of restriction in mobility. Now, of course, the longer and longer the fusion is that you get, uh, the more likely it is going to be to really notice, make a functional, noticeable difference. Uh, but again, if your hip movement is good, and uh, it's not too many segments being done, you're going to notice an improvement in your posture, not a worsening with the metallic devices. Thank you. If a person has a history of forming severe colloids after past surgeries, 
Is that person at increased risk of developing internal scarring after a spinal surgery? I am not aware of any research about that. It's a great question, um, but I can tell you the biggest way that we prevent um, uh, prevent scarring, which has been blamed for for pain after surgery, is just to get the people moving. You know, movement is really critical at limiting scar tissue formation after the procedure. Um, it's a great question about the keloids and and postoperative deep scarring. Not, but I don't believe it's been answered. Uh, but the, my my, if if it was my patient asking me that, I'd say we're going to avoid that two ways. You know, we, we I typically have a plastic surgeon see them after their wound is healed up to see if they need any revision, and then secondly, we're going to prevent the deep scarring by being active immediately after surgery. Thank you. Can you discuss anesthetics? For example, a patient who had a bad reaction during a previous surgery, how would they discuss that with the surgical team? One of the things that they would say is I would really like to meet with and consult with an anesthesiologist prior to my procedure. Again, if it's not an emergent procedure, not an urgent procedure, but it's an elective, you've got time to do this. And I would just at the doctor's office say, do you have an anesthesiologist you typically are using or a team of anesthesiologists? And if so, I usually get me in there for a brief consult with them to talk about what happened. Uh, it is important if you had a really bad reaction, of course, to get your records from where this all happened so you can get some kind of uh, definitive diagnosis so that the anesthesiologist that you're going to be using know what to look out for. Thank you. Do you need special equipment at home to recover after spinal surgery? On some occasions, particularly the older you are, um, you know, you may need walkers, elevated toilet seats, you know, shower chairs, uh, you know, different ambulation aids and grasping aids. Uh, typically, again, it's the bigger surgeries and the bigger patients that are going to need those. Um, in most of the procedures that I do now, it's uh, it's not not typical. Thank you. How do you know um, when it, if your symptoms are bad enough for surgery? For example. If you are having neck issues and now you're having numbness in your hand or your arm, or you're getting dizzy, would those be reasons to have surgery? They would be reasons to definitely consult with a surgeon and uh, and or your pain management uh, professional. And if the results of the consultation led to a discussion of surgery, then of course, like I said, a second opinion is always wise. Thank you. How long does the actual surgery for a spinal fusion usually take? And how long do you have to recover in the hospital? Fusions are all different colors. Um, and they come in the variety of a one level fusion, which can typically take, you know, 45 minutes or so to do, uh, all the way up to a 10 or 12 level fusion that can take a few hours in surgery. Uh, the vast majority of fusions uh, take an hour to two hours max. Thank you. If I decide to uh, put off my elective spinal surgery a little longer, is that going to cause more damage? Typically not. If you have got significant weakness or a, a actual paralysis of a limb as a result of the spinal condition, then you know you don't want to delay it forever. Um, you certainly have got some time to get other opinions, etc. But uh, in most cases, as long as you don't have any significant weakness, it's, the, the pain alone is not going to be a reason to necess necessarily uh, uh, cause trouble by waiting. Thank you. If you are doing um, surgery on the cervical spine, do you ever go in through the front, through the throat? Yeah, most of the time now, since the 1950s, that's kind of the approach of choice, if you will. A uh, small cut is made on the left or right side of the neck, and the only thing that's really cut is the skin, and it allows you quick access to the front of the spine, again, with very minimal, very minimal uh, dissection or very minimal uh, tissue trauma. That's why it's become so popular uh, over the last uh, you know, 70 years, because it's, it's a quick way to get to the spine to do a lot of corrective surgical procedures with minimal blood loss and minimal trauma to the body. Thank you.
Are doctors normally receptive to a patient asking if they can talk to previous patients that have already had that surgery? They absolutely should be. And it's important that you remember that there's a variety of uh, health information, privacy things that go into this ask so that uh, your surgeon doesn't kind of just is not able to click his fingers and, and have you on the phone with somebody. But by the same token, uh, I really think it's a wise patient that says, hey, you know, can I reach out to a couple people and you've cleared it ahead of time, you know, so that their privacy is not invaded. And uh, yeah, I usually find those those discussions for the patient to be fruitful. Thank you. What is the recovery time for disc repair and two-level fusion? I'm not sure what you mean by disc repair, but a two-level fusion, you can break it up into um, three basic parts. There's the initial recovery, which is the skin healing and the, a lot of the surgical trauma pain going away, and that's the first two to three weeks. Then there's the returning to normal activity uh, recovery, uh, which can be measured as, uh, in some surgeons' cases, as short as two months to as long as six to eight months. And then there's the final phase of the recovery, which is the x-ray recovery, where you see the actual fusion occurring. And that can be upwards of 18 months plus. Thank you. Is foot drop a common issue after surgery? And if so, is there a way to recover from it? It's an extremely uncommon condition after surgery. One of the things that I find that's interesting is pe patients will kind of forget that, and the, that's why I make sure I carefully demonstrate this to the patients before surgery, that they've had some degree, if not a full foot drop prior to surgery. Foot drop is one of the more common reasons that I actually do surgery on the low back. Um, triceps weakness for the neck, wrist extension weakness for the neck. And if you demonstrate this to the patients, because a lot of times it's not a full paralysis, it's just a weakness. And you have to actually really demonstrate it to them ahead of time. My bet is that, uh, you know, if you if a patient woke up with a quote unquote new foot drop, uh, that they're, I, just in my experience, I've usually seen what people have said is they didn't realize that they actually had one prior. Um, or, the, you know, you can get a complication of a foot drop, but they're very, very rare. Very rare. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Hughes. If we do not have a chance to answer your question on the live, we will answer it in the comments below. Dr. Hughes, would you like to close? I would. I would just like to say how much I appreciate uh, all the hard work that uh, everybody that makes these things up uh, goes to. And I really appreciate getting to amplify the message, uh, which is, as I say, I say it one on one multiple times a day, but it's great to do it to, for everybody. And uh, thank you, Peggy and Aaron and everybody else for doing this.